Chapter 35. The Masthead. It was during the more pleasant weather that in due rotation with the other seamen, my first masthead came round. In most American whalemen, the mastheads are manned almost simultaneously with the vessels leaving her port, even though she may have 15,000 miles and more to sail ere reaching her proper cruising ground. And if, after a three, four, or five years' voyage, she is drawing nigh home with anything empty in her, say an empty vial even, then her mastheads are kept manned to the last, and not till her skysail poles sail in amongst the spires of the port does she altogether relinquish the hope of capturing one whale more. Now, as this business of standing mastheads, ashore or afloat, is a very ancient and interesting one, let us in some measure expatiate here. I take it that the earliest standers of mastheads were the old Egyptians, because in all my researches I find none prior to them. For though their progenitors, the builders of Babel, must doubtless by their tower have intended to rear the loftiest masthead in all Asia or Africa either, yet, ere the final truck was put to it, as that great stone mast of theirs may be said to have gone by the board, in the dread gale of God's wrath, therefore we cannot give these Babel builders priority over the Egyptians, and that the Egyptians were a nation of masthead standers is an assertion based upon the general belief among archaeologists that the first pyramids were founded for astronomical purposes, a theory singularly supported by the peculiar stair-like formation of all four sides of those edifices, whereby with prodigious long upliftings of their legs those old astronomers were wont to mount to the apex and sing out for new stars even as the lookouts of a modern ship sing out for a sail, or a whale just bearing in sight. In St. Stylites, the famous Christian hermit of old times, who built him a lofty stone pillar in the desert, and spent the whole latter portion of his life on its summit, hoisting his food from the ground with a tackle, in him we have a remarkable instance of a dauntless stander of mastheads, who was not to be driven from his place by fogs or frosts, rain, hail, or sleet, but valiantly facing everything out to the last, literally died at his post. Of modern standers of mastheads we have but a lifeless set, mere stone, iron, and bronze men, who, though well capable of facing out a stiff gale, are entirely incompetent to the business of singing out upon discovering any strange sight. There is Napoleon, who, upon the top of the column of Vendôme, stands with arms folded, some one hundred and fifty feet in the air, careless now who rules the decks below, whether Louis Philippe, Louis Blanc, or Louis the Devil. Great Washington, too, stands high aloft on his towering mainmast in Baltimore, and like one of Hercules' pillars, his column marks that point of human grandeur beyond which few mortals will go. Admiral Nelson, also on a capstan of gunmetal, stands his masthead in Trafalgar Square, and ever, when most obscured by that London smoke, token is yet given that a hidden hero is there. For where there is smoke, there must be fire. But neither Great Washington, nor Napoleon, nor Nelson will answer a single hail from below, however madly invoked, to befriend by their counsels the distracted decks upon which they gaze however it may be surmised that their spirits penetrate through the thick haze of the future and descry what shoals and what rocks must be shunned. It may seem unwarrantable to couple in any respect the masthead standards of the land with those of the sea, but that in truth it is not so is plainly evinced by an item for which Obed Macy, the sole historian of Nantucket, stands accountable. The worthy Obed tells us that in the early times of the whale fishery, ere ships were regularly launched in pursuit of the game, the people of that island erected lofty spars along the sea coast, to which the lookouts ascended by means of nailed cleats, something as fowls go upstairs in a hen house. A few years ago this same plan was adopted by the Bay Whalemen of New Zealand, who, upon descrying the game, gave notice to the ready-manned boats nigh the beach. But this custom has now become obsolete. Turn we then to the one proper masthead, that of a whale ship at sea. 
The three mastheads are kept manned from sunrise to sunset, the seamen taking their regular turns, as at the helm, and relieving each other every two hours. In the serene weather of the tropics, it is exceedingly pleasant, the masthead. Nay, to a dreamy, meditative man, it is delightful. There you stand, a hundred feet above the silent decks, striding along the deep, as if the masts were gigantic stilts, while beneath you, and between your legs, as it were, swim the hugest monsters of the sea, even as ships once sailed between the boots of the famous Colossus at Old Rhodes. There you stand, lost in the infinite series of the sea, with nothing ruffled but the waves. The tranced ship indolently rolls, the drowsy trade winds blow, everything resolves you into a languor. For the most part, in this tropic whaling life, the sublime uneventfulness invests you. You hear no news, read no gazettes, extras with startling accounts of commonplaces never delude you into unnecessary excitements, you hear of no domestic afflictions, bankrupt securities, fall of stocks, are never troubled with the thought of what you shall have for dinner, for all your meals for three years and more are snugly stowed in casks, and your bill of fare is immutable. In one of those southern whalemen, on a long three or four years' voyage, as often happens, the sum of the various hours you spend at the masthead would amount to several entire months, and it is much to be deplored that the place to which you devote so considerable a portion of the whole term of your natural life should be so sadly destitute of anything approaching to a cozy inhabitiveness, or adapted to breed a comfortable localness of feeling, such as pertains to a bed, a hammock, a hearse, a sentry box, a pulpit, a coach, or any other of those small and snug contrivances in which men temporarily isolate themselves. Your most usual point of perch is the head of the t'gallant mast, where you stand upon two thin parallel sticks, almost peculiar to whalemen, called the t'gallant cross-trees. Here, tossed about by the sea, the beginner feels about as cozy as he would standing on a bull's horns. To be sure, in cold weather you may carry your house aloft with you in the shape of a watch coat, but properly speaking, the thickest watch coat is no more of a house than the unclad body, for as the soul is glued inside of its fleshy tabernacle and cannot freely move about in it, nor even move out of it without running great risk of perishing, like an ignorant pilgrim crossing the snowy Alps in winter, so a watch coat is not so much of a house as it is a mere envelope or additional skin encasing you. You cannot put a shelf or chest of drawers in your body, and no more can you make a convenient closet of your watch coat. Concerning all this, it is much to be deplored that the mastheads of a southern whale ship are unprovided with those enviable little tents or pulpits called crow's nests, in which the lookouts of a Greenland whaler are protected from the inclement weather of the frozen seas. In the fireside narrative of Captain Sleet, entitled A Voyage Among the Icebergs in Quest of the Greenland Whale, and incidentally for the rediscovery of the lost Icelandic colonies of old Greenland, in this admirable volume, all standards of mastheads are furnished with a charmingly circumstantial account of the then recently invented crow's nest of the glacier, which was the name of Captain Sleet's good craft. He called it the Sleet's Crow's Nest in honor of himself, he being the original inventor and patentee and free from all ridiculous false delicacy, and holding that if we call our own children after our own names, we fathers being the original inventors and patentees, so likewise we should denominate after ourselves any other apparatus we may beget. In shape, the sleet's crow's nest is something like a large tierce or pipe. It is open above, however, where it is furnished with a movable side screen to keep to windward of your head in a hard gale. Being fixed on the summit of the mast, you ascend into it through a little trap hatch in the bottom. On the after side, or the side next to the stern of the ship, is a comfortable seat with a locker underneath for umbrellas, comforters, and coats. In front is a leather rack in which to keep your speaking trumpet, pipe, telescope, and other nautical conveniences. 
When Captain Sleet in person stood his mast head in this crow's nest of his, he tells us that he always had a rifle with him, also fixed in the rack, together with a powder flask and shot, for the purpose of popping off the stray narwhales or vagrant sea unicorns infesting those waters, for you cannot successfully shoot at them from the deck owing to the resistance of the water, but to shoot down upon them is a very different thing. Now, it was plainly a labor of love for Captain Sleet to describe, as he does, all the little detailed conveniences of his crow's nest, but though he so enlarges upon many of these, and though he treats us to a very scientific account of his experiments in this crow's nest, with a small compass he kept there for the purpose of counteracting the errors resulting from what is called the local attraction of all binnacle magnets, an error ascribable to the horizontal vicinity of the iron in the ship's planks, and in the glacier's case, perhaps, to there having been so many broken-down blacksmiths among her crew, I say that though the captain is very discreet and scientific here, yet for all his learned binnacle deviations, azimuth compass observations, and approximate errors, he knows very well, Captain Sleet, that he was not so much immersed in those profound magnetic meditations as to fail being attracted occasionally towards that well-replenished little case bottle so nicely tucked in on one side of his crow's nest within easy reach of his hand. Though upon the whole I greatly admire and even love the brave, the honest, and learned captain, yet I take it very ill of him that he should so utterly ignore that case bottle, seeing what a faithful friend and comforter it must have been, while with mittened fingers and hooded head he was studying the mathematics aloft there in that bird's nest within three or four perches of the pole. But if we southern whale-fishers are not so snugly housed aloft as Captain Sleet and his Greenlandmen were, yet that disadvantage is greatly counterbalanced by the widely contrasting serenity of those seductive seas in which we south-fishers mostly float. For one, I used to lounge up in the rigging very leisurely, resting in the top to have a chat with Queequeg, or anyone else off-duty whom I might find there. Then, ascending a little way further, and throwing a lazy leg over the topsail yard, take a preliminary view of the watery pastures, and so at last mount to my ultimate destination. Let me make a clean breast of it here, and frankly admit that I kept but sorry guard. With the problem of the universe revolving in me, how could I, being left completely to myself, at such a thought-engendering altitude, how could I but lightly hold my obligations to observe all whale ships' standing orders, keep your weather eye open, and sing out every time? And let me in this place movingly admonish you, you shipowners of Nantucket, beware of enlisting in your vigilant fisheries any lad with lean brow and hollow eye, given to unseasonable meditativeness, and who offers to ship with the Phaedon instead of Bowditch in his head. Beware of such a one, I say. Your whales must be seen before they can be killed, and this sunken-eyed young Platonist will tow you ten wakes round the world and never make you one pint of sperm the richer. Nor are these monitions at all unneeded. For nowadays, the whale fishery furnishes an asylum for many romantic, melancholy, and absent-minded young men, disgusted with the carking cares of earth, and seeking sentiment in tar and blubber. Child Harrell not infrequently perches himself upon the masthead of some luckless, disappointed whale-ship, and in moody phrase ejaculates, Roll on, thou deep, dark blue ocean, roll! Ten thousand blubber-hunters sweep over thee in vain. Very often do the captains of such ships take those absent-minded young philosophers to task, upbraiding them with not feeling sufficient interest in the voyage, half hinting that they are so hopelessly lost to all honorable ambition, as that in their secret souls they would rather not see whales than otherwise. But all in vain. Those young Platonists have a notion that their vision is imperfect. They are short-sighted. What use, then, to strain the visual nerve? They have left their opera glasses at home. "'Why, thou monkey,' said a harpooner to one of these lads, "'we've been cruising now hard upon three years, "'and thou hast not raised a whale yet. "'Whales are scarce as hen's teeth whenever thou art up here.' "'Perhaps they were. 
Or perhaps there might have been shoals of them in the far horizon, but lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant, unconscious reverie is this absent-minded youth by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts, that at last he loses his identity, takes the mystic ocean at his feet for the visible image of that deep, blue, bottomless soul pervading mankind and nature, and every strange, half-seen, gliding, beautiful thing that eludes him, every dimly discovered, uprising fin of some undiscernible form seems to him the embodiment of those elusive thoughts that only people the soul by continually flitting through it. In this enchanted mood, thy spirit ebbs away to whence it came, becomes diffused through time and space like Cramer's sprinkled pantheistic ashes, forming at last a part of every shore, the round globe over. There is no life in thee now except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship, by her borrowed from the sea, by the sea from the inscrutable tides of God. But while this sleep, this dream is on you, move your foot or hand an inch, slip your hold at all, and your identity comes back in horror. Over Descartian vortices you hover, and perhaps at midday, in the fairest weather, with one half-throttled shriek you drop through that transparent air into the summer sea, no more to rise forever. Heed it well, you pantheists. <laughs> <laughs>